This is Love Your Work. On this show, we help you make it as a creative entrepreneur, find your unique voice, find the right mindset to succeed, and be the first to capitalize on new opportunities to make a living making your art. I am David Cadavy. If you want to join us here on Love Your Work every Thursday, please hit subscribe on your podcast app and get your free creative productivity toolkit. Sign up at cadavy.net slash tools. What if success isn't about scaling up as big as possible? What if success is actually about the freedom to call your own shots? Paul Jarvis was asking himself these questions as he left the corporate world way back in the 90s. Now he works from his home in the woods on an island near Vancouver. He explores what he's learned in his new book, Company of One, Why Staying Small is the Next Big Thing for Business. Previously, Paul was a freelance designer working with clients such as Microsoft, Mercedes-Benz, and Marie Forleo. He now writes books and makes courses and software products, courses such as Creative Class, which teaches you how to go pro in your freelance career, and software such as Fathom Analytics, which gives you simple website analytics without tracking or storing your users' personal data. In this conversation with Paul, you'll learn how to manage your time in a company of one. Paul shares specific details on how he manages his time on a weekly basis, a monthly basis, and beyond. How to build your company of one around your skills. How does Paul build on his strengths and make his weaknesses irrelevant? And how to make room for creativity by being organized. Learn why systems and processes actually enhance creativity rather than stifle it. Do you get caught up in worrying about what you should do? Does that make you lose sight of what you want to do? Here's a quick tip from my book, The Heart to Start. We often think we're going to make a plan and follow that plan, but when we try to do that, it rarely works. Meanwhile, we're stifling our curiosity. Our curiosity is the fuel that can take us to our creative destiny. And as you start something new in 2019, think about what you're curious about. I bet you can work on that thing harder than anyone else can. So follow your curiosity. You'll be surprised how far it can take you. If you haven't read The Heart to Start, the book one Amazon reviewer calls basically faultless self-help, the new year is the perfect time. Search for The Heart to Start on Amazon, Audible, or wherever books and audiobooks are sold. Here's Paul Jarvis. I'm really happy to be talking with Paul Jarvis today. Uh, Paul is the author of the new book, Company of One, Why Staying Small is the Next Big Thing for Business. And, you know, when I first heard this title, I thought, well, that's perfect. That makes perfect sense to me. I'm a company of one. I've been a company of one for uh, ten over 10 years now. Um, but I imagine that for a lot of people, this is a contrarian idea. Um, what kind of pushback or have you gotten pushback when you've told people that you're writing this book called Company of One? Yeah, I mean, it, it's fun. It's funny that you bring that up because I think people either think that it is the most controversial um, business slash capitalist idea on the planet, or they're like, you're explaining how I run my business. <laughs> so I've gotten sort of both sides. To be honest, I was actually surprised because um, this is a traditionally published book as opposed to all my other ones that were self-published. I was surprised that... Um, <laughs> the the man or the the woman in air quotes however you want to say it was interested in the book like i was surprised that hmm. an industry that is not a company of one was interested in this kind of contrary to them idea but uh, i like i was as surprised as anybody else when when an agent first of all wanted to work with me and then when a publisher was like yeah we definitely this is a great <laughs> this is a great idea why, why don't we go ahead with this so it's it's been a mixed bag completely so what was that reaction like how did that play out when the man the woman the person uh showed interest in this uh in this idea yeah, so there was actually so there's a few um, publishing houses interested in the book, and the the one that I ultimately went with, he, um, the editor, because you, when you're talking to publishers, you you typically speak to the editor that wants to edit your book, who then sells it to the publisher themselves. And so I was speaking with the editor, and he he's been in the business for a long time, and he said to be to be quite frank, 
I really just look for contrarianly valid <laughs> ideas. <laughs> he said, I'm bored of the way uh, business books work. So I only want to do books like this that kind of challenge uh, preconceived notions in a smart way. And I was like, that this sounds like a person I really want to work with. <laughs> so it sounds like, were you going through that... Uh traditional progression of I have this proposal and here's the book title. The book title was Company of One from the beginning. Yeah. So the publisher came up with the uh, the why staying small is the next big thing for business, which I really like. But I came to my agent with the with the name Company of One. She really liked it. And then when we wrote the book proposal, which was such a process, <laughs> it was a very long process. But and yeah, they really like that title really resonated with them, which is good because by that point it had been quite a while that I'd been sitting with it and thinking about it. And every day it kind of resonated more and more with me that this feels like a great encapsulation of the mindset that I wanted to explore and the thesis that I wanted to present as the idea. Mm-hmm. So I was just like, okay, this is good that there's buy-in. Because I know that's not always the experiment, the experience with some authors where a publisher is like, yes, we love the idea, but now we need to change everything about it. Oh yeah. <laughs> well I'm 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 pleasantly surprised to learn uh that I guess I'll just call it the corporate world is mm-hmm is interested in this type of idea or the mainstream is interested in this type of idea. What, what kind of, what was the, the source of that interest for them? Um, I think they, I think like if people are paying attention, they're seeing that this is, that this is a trend where we don't need to operate like business as usual doesn't mean anything if it's not founded in, in logic anymore. Like I think that, Corporate, like huge corporations have only existed for such a tiny blip in like commerce and society that I think that people are just seeing like, oh, there can be ways to, to do well, to have a fulfilling life, to, to definitely make some money in the process while challenging the idea that like you have to grow, you have to take funding, you have to hire X people, you have to growth hack. It has to be 10 X for everything. Like, I just think that there's enough of that out in the world. And I mean, sometimes that can be valid, maybe, but I, there's not enough people talking about this idea. But luckily, like, it isn't just me talking about it. Like, I know you've had Jason Fried on your podcast, who's a big proponent of, of questioning growth and staying small. So, a few other books that have been published Bo, uh, Bo Burlingham or Bo Burlington, can't remember his name. Small Giants was released, I think, 11 years ago. Elaine Pofield released a book last year called. The one million dollar one person business. So there is kind of, like I just I just see this as like a, a grow, which is like the worst pun ever. <laughs> I see this idea of challenging growth as like a growing trend in <laughs> in the world. Yeah, that, that that's a, a, a oxymoronic in a way, I guess. <laughs> um, so, what are the the benefits of building a company of one? What's the what's the gist of this idea? Yeah, so the so the first of all the clarification is that kind of like Tim Ferriss's 4-hour work week doesn't really advocate that you literally work 4 hours a week because <clears throat> I don't think Tim does that or ever has. But the so the idea that of company of one is not that you are a literal one person business, you can be but you don't have to be is more so that you question the idea that the next step in business success is always growth. Because I think that a lot of people think that that's the case or a lot of people could pressure business owners or entrepreneurs that that is the case. I know I felt that pressure in in, in my business as well. Mm-hmm. And I think the book really explores the, this thesis that the the byproduct of business success is a freedom to make choices. It's not that you have to grow. And I mean in looking at like the research that I did for the book and and the the the, the people that I interviewed and I just found I just found that there's this like disconnect of what people what like thought leaders on the internet or in like speeches are saying and what the data is showing in terms of outside of just here's my story i grew therefore all growth is good <laughs> what a lot of business people take such a tiny data set of just mm-hmm. themselves and their experiences and when i looked at uh, like bigger studies i was like Th- these these things aren't lining up. Like there's no like all of the all of the research that i found and all the data that i found was showing that growth 
can not only be a bad decision, but it can sometimes be the most detrimental decision you make in your business ever. Which I was like, whoa. So one, this is really good because I'm writing a book on the subject. But two, I think more people need to be aware of this. That there's... like, If it's your business, you. Sh- I feel like if you start a business, it's because you want to be able to make more choices in your life. You want to have autonomy. You want to be able... You want to have that freedom. Because we've typically left other jobs where we didn't have that. And we're like, Oh, if I start my own company, I'm going to do things differently. And then we start and then we end up in the same place. <laughs> so where did you see this reflected in the data that this was something that um, was not just a, a lifestyle choice, but that was actually good for a company to not focus on on growth above yes. all else? Yeah. So there was, there was kind of two studies that as soon as I found these, I was like, one, this is awesome. And two, there's there's probably a lot more here that I can dig into. And I mean, as a writer, when I write articles, especially for my mailing list, I write from a place of like, this is my personal experience. But when I'm writing books, I try to include like, here's some actually so, some more data and like a bigger data set. So the two studies that I found that I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, this this needs to be talked about. Startup Genome Project a couple years ago looked at 3,200 startups and found that 74% of them failed, not because of competition or business plans, but because they scaled up too quickly. And then another study done by the Kauffman Foundation looked at that. Um, it's this Inc. Magazine, like the the top five, the, the Inc. 5000. Oh I guess yeah, it's the called. Inc. 5000. You know, it's yeah, a huge honor Inc. to be on the Inc. 5000. Exactly. So the Kauffman Foundation looked at the companies on that list five to eight years later and found that two thirds of them had actually gone out of business Hmm. or undergone massive layoffs or sold below market value. Kind of confirming that first study, the Startup Genome Project, in so much as they were finding that these companies weren't able to become self-sustaining because they were growing and spending based on projected levels. So they were growing in hopes that they would be profitable. And it's like, that's such a huge risk, man. Like that's... I don't like I feel like people on the outside think that entrepreneurs are like the risky people like we're all kind of like the the top gun pilots not to date myself <laughs> in, in terms of movies. I get it. yeah but I just think that like of myself and like of all the entrepreneurs I know like we're very risk averse like I don't want to take huge risks like that like I would rather spend based on actual profit instead of projected Income and just looking at like those two studies specifically, I was like, they're, they're like, we need to kind of figure this out. We need to have more intelligent conversations as opposed to just posting, um, like these trite messages on Instagram across mountain, somebody sitting on like top of a mountain and with some like tired business advice about growth. Yeah. So, what's, what's driving the, the people who are doing the opposite <clears throat> of a company of one principles? Uh, what, what are what's the what is driving their thought process? Yeah, so I think I think part of it is is kind of just human nature and ego. I think part of it is just that to like it seems better or it puts ourselves in a higher social standing if we say like if you ask me what I do or like what my work looks like, say like my days, I'm, like I sit in a room in my house in my pajamas and I work at a computer by myself, which doesn't sound like I, I think my job is tremendously interesting, at least to me, but like the the way that it works is is that. Like I don't have an office, I don't have employees, I also I have almost no expenses. But like if I was at a dinner party and I said that versus me saying like, well, I have a business and it has like a thousand people across 18 offices in six countries, like that sounds like socially that sounds better. And I think that just like in in our personal lives, we can kind of get caught up in this keeping up with the Joneses mentality. I think the same. Ha- like I think I think we kind of keep up with the digital business Joneses as well, especially with social media and seeing like income reports from people. And I don't think people publish income reports unless they're making six figures a month. At least I've never seen. By the way, look at my income reports. <laughs> You'll see I'm naked nowhere near that. So. <laughs> Yeah, so I just think that there's there's this comparison trap that we all fall into and I think that it comes from this 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 like real human need of wanting to be loved and respected and valued which that's not a bad thing but I think that when we let that guide decisions and that's really what the book is looking at is like why are the decisions that you're making being made and and is it being made from a place of 
like what you think other people would value you for, or where you think other people's version of success lies? Or is it what you actually want? Is it the way that you actually want to spend your life? Like, are you making decisions around how you want to spend your days? And I mean, you brought up lifestyle business. I think that every business is a lifestyle business. I think if mm-hmm. you have like VC money and you're a high tech like company in the valley, you're going to have a very specific lifestyle. If you work at a corporation, your butt is going to have to be in a chair from nine to five Monday to Friday. Like every business is a lifestyle. But I think if we flip it around and think about, okay, if we're working for ourselves, what lifestyle do we actually truly want? And then how can we build a business around that? Like, yeah, it has to be profitable, but mm. why don't we make better decisions about what we actually want? Because if we're the ones running the show and steering the ship, like, <laughs> why don't we do things that make sense for us instead of what makes sense for like social standing or ego? I, I love this idea of building the business around the type of lifestyle that you want. That's something I know that I've striven <clears throat> to do if that's a word, striven, uh, so. for, for a long time. So what are some ways that you personally have built your company of one around the lifestyle that you wanted? Yeah, so I know I, I'm i very stress adverse as well. So I try to do things that are the least, stre- <laughs> that are the least stressful. Mm-hmm. So having employees for me, it, it would be stressful because I would feel responsible for them. So I do work with a team. I have about five or six people that I work with. They're all freelancers. They require no management, which is good because I'm an awful manager. I don't know how to delegate. I only know how to do. And I don't want to foster that. um, I don't want to foster that and learn how to do it better, (laughs) to be honest. Um, I also know that if I need less money in my life, I'm less stressed out about money because every month I can become profitable faster because I know how much money I need to, to make to, to reach profitability status. So I don't like having employees or if I have people that I work with, I don't want to manage them. I know that if I keep my life um, as minimal, but still comfor- obviously comfortable um, as possible, um, I'm not living in a cave and eating like cans of beans or anything <laughs> like that. Even though I do live in the woods on an island. Um, and the other thing is I don't like I don't like having to deal with emergencies. And I mean that kind of harkens back to my days when I was doing client service work, which I've done for the, the bulk of my career, where I would always tell my I would I was a designer for forever since the 90s for myself. And I would always tell my I would always tell my clients like there are no design emergencies. Like, I'm going to do the work. I'm going to give it to you on time in the exact time that I said it was like, if I say you're going to get it in two days, you will get it in two days. I don't need to be emailing you at 2 a.m. to prove this. You will get it. So, there are no design emergencies. So, when I moved into products, I was like, okay, I want to have products that don't require like 24, like, I don't want to be on call. I feel like that would be so stressful. And I mean, sometimes that ha- like sometimes there are things like I don't have a 100% idyllic life where I work like the four hours a week kind of thing. But like, if my default is always busy or always on call, it is very stressful. And I don't like that. So that's kind of the way that I've kind of shaped. And so I make business decisions that get me more aligned or closer aligned to those values that I have. Instead of just making decisions based on well, like, well, that sounds like a good opportunity. And then I'll, I'll deal with the repercussions or the obligations of that opportunity later. No, I'd rather see like, okay, what do I want to move towards? I'm going to say yes or no to things based on their alignment to the, the purpose that I have for running my business in the first place. Yeah, just to abstract those concepts a little bit of what you just talked about. Um, you said that you're, you're not a great manager. I'm also a terrible manager. I'm learning that um, the more that I can, you know, like my podcast, people who edit my podcast, the more that I can find somebody who is a good manager, who will manage other people who put together the podcast, like, that's the best. If I don't have mm-hmm. to manage that person, that's great. So I think, you know, building your business around your skills profile, in a way, is like, what's your yeah. core skill? Um what are the things that you're not that good at? I mean, sometimes you can get better at some things. It's okay to have a growth mindset about things, but for sure, you know, be be realistic. Uh, I guess the next one that's interesting to me is that is that this this goes into your 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 personal expenses as well, like the lifestyle that you have to lead, um, or the lifestyle that you want to lead, and and the expenses that you what your expense requirements are. As a person, you know, this is one of these things that I always saw with friends who were 
uh, you know, on track to, to be a lawyer is that they, they say, well, I'm going to do corporate law for a little while. And then eventually I'm going to go change over to this thing where I'm saving the world. But then they get caught into this. They're, be, to be a corporate lawyer, they've got to have these expensive suits. Um, they're hanging out with other corporate lawyers. They're eating more expensive. dollars martinis. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they're drinking more expensive drinks. They're, they're uh, eating mo- at more expensive restaurants. And hey, if you love that lifestyle and you're cool with it, they're like, go for it. But then they, they, they lose sight of the track they're trying to go on. And then another thing that was interesting to me is, uh, is I, well, see, I, I wrote down resource allocation here. And I guess that's like what I think of when, uh, when you talk about not liking stress is, mm-hmm. is that that's also a resource allocation decision, right? Is that, um, you, each interruption that you have, each emergency you have uses r- resources um, that, you know, you're only one person, so you can't really, uh, allocate that one person, you know, uh, resource yeah. to, to two things at once. And so when an emergency happens, whatever you were working on, you're not working on, et cetera. So I guess let's, let's go back through those things. Um, yeah. and, uh, let's talk about this idea of, of building the business around your skills profile. Yeah, and I mean, I think you. I think what you said w- was really smart and valid in that it's okay to be it's okay to, okay to not know how to do something and want to grow that skill set. I mean, I've grown as a because I've run my business for twenty years, and when I started, all I knew how to do was graphic design because I'd just left a, an agency job as a designer, mm-hmm. so I had to learn how and the hard way for me because I don't know any. <laughs> And I'm not smart enough to do it any other way. Like I had to learn how the the mechanics of business when I started working for myself in the '90s, and so like that was something I absolutely needed to learn how to do. Like, can I do my own accounting? Hell no. Like, I, I would rather pay an accountant for that because I feel like, and this isn't backed on data. This is just backed on like my own personal experience. Like, and of one where if I have a good accountant, they're going to save me more money than I have to give to the government every year. Which is like when I started my business, I was like, okay, if I make this much, I'm going to give the government this percentage of my income. And like that's, how, but it's not, it's so much more complicated than that. And I feel like a good accountant will tell you how to be more creative in a legal above the board, obviously, mm-hmm. <laughs> way, but they'll show you how to allocate different funds into different buckets. And then it means you, you spend less money. Same with my lawyer. I'm not going to get a law degree to run my business, but I do need a lawyer for certain things. Same with copy editing. I mean, it, it's similar to, uh, to you hiring somebody to manage the podcast editing. Like my copy editor does a job that I can't... Like I've tried to actually become a better proofreader of my work. I can't. I realize that writing and editing are different jobs and different roles. So... I don't need to manage him though. So I, I pay him more than a copy editor that I could find on, say, Fiverr. Like he's a top of industry at what he does, but I don't have to manage him. We have a shared Google Drive. He knows that he gets a notification when I upload a new file there. He edits it. He knows my voice, my style, everything. If he has a problem, then we communicate. If not, we don't. I've never talked to him on the phone. I don't know where he lives. To be to be <laughs> honest, I think he lives in Georgia, but I'm, like we've never had a, a real time conversation because we haven't needed to. And so I'm always looking for if I am going to, if I if it's something that I'm not going to be able to 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 learn how to do or something that I know I don't want to do. I want to find the person who's the best at that. And yes, I'm probably going to pay them more. But the net net is going to be less stressful for me and it's going to be better work product at the end of it because he does good work. And if I have no typos in my, in my newsletter, then I get no complaints for my newsletter and it's a win win. Yeah. And how about this idea of uh, your personal expenses too, keeping your personal expenses low yeah. and designing your business around that? How, how do you think about that? Yeah. I mean, like I definitely lean much more towards minimalism than anything else but i think that i think that minimalism isn't about learning to live with less minimalism is about figuring out what enough is and i mean this is this is also kind of the main point of the book and i think that the counterpoint to grow forever at all costs is this idea of enough so for my own personal finances i'm like like i was approved when when my wife and i bought the house that we live in I think we were approved for probably three times more than the house is worth just because the bank is like, 
if they buy a more expensive house, they're going to have to give us more money in interest over <laughs> like 25 mm. years or whatever. And we're like, why do we like, it's just the two of us. Like we don't need a bigger right now. I wish we had one less bathroom because bathrooms suck to have to clean. So if we only had one bathroom, it would be, re- it would be much better. So I think that minimum, like thinking about what enough is and thinking about kind of like, what do I need? And like what makes my life more complete is a lot easier than trying to keep up with everybody else, which I mean, I can't even see like if I'm keeping up with the Joneses, I can't see my neighbors because I live in the woods and I have acreage. (laughs) So I don't even know what their houses look like other than the ones that I'm friends with. So I just feel like I have freedom from financial worry if I cut out the excess of spending. And if you work for yourself, you're basically not profitable until one, your business is making more than the business is spending. But two, your business is making more than you are personally spending. Because even though your income should be separate and your finances and books should be and bank accounts should be separate, if your business is going to to work as, as a solo business, it needs to cover the life that you have. So you have two options there. You either have to make more, which can be harder, more stressful, more responsibilities, or you need to find, uh, or you need to be comfortable with maybe where things are at or with scaling back. And I think that there's just like your corporate lawyer friends, I think there's this kind of, there's a trend if, if we aren't thinking about it and, and having like an internal dialogue about it where the more we make, the more we spend. And we just think that that's just the way things go. Where I don't think that that has to be the case. Like you don't need to, every time you get a raise, you don't need a fancier car. You don't need a bigger house if what you have is, is currently working. Right. So I just think that there's, there's ways to be a bit more mindful about that. And it's definitely hard. Like it's definitely hard to be mindful. Uh, I, I know this from personal experience and there was a, I wish I could remember the study. There's a study done. I know the guy, the researcher's name was Timothy Walker and the study was that. They put people in a room. They didn't, they told them that the study was for something else. And they said that you just have to sit here. You don't have your phone. There's a button on the table. And if you press it, you'll get an electric shock. It's not going to kill you, but you don't have to press the button. And they would leave the room. Most of the people press the button instead of sitting alone with their own thoughts. And I'm just like, wow. Like it's kind of like being mindful and introspective is fucking tough. Like most people would rather press more men than women, by the way, press the button too. But like it's hard to just sit and 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 think about like what we actually want, like what makes us happy, what makes us content. So it's it's hard work. Like I I would never say that it's easy work, but I do think that it's necessary. Well, one of the great things about having a more minimalist lifestyle about not spending as much money is for myself, is just the ability to say no to yeah. so many things that I I don't want to do and be, be able to say yes to things that I do want to do. Is that uh, one of the benefits that you get yourself? Yeah, for for sure. Like I like the I like the freedom to make choices. And I feel like if I have to continue like if I have to say yes because I have no choice, that's not a situation that I want to put myself in. So I'll do everything in my power to not have to to not have to be put in that situation. And what about like the idea of of resource allocation? And one thing I've noticed with you was that uh, as you were writing this book, you took a break from some of your other things. Can you talk yeah. about that process? Yeah, so I'm bad at multitasking. So, so, and I feel like every every interruption, every notification, everything that takes us away from our work, is is multi is is turning our brain to multitasking mode and I'm not smart enough to be able to do two things well at the same time quickly and I, I honestly I don't think that anybody is and so I always look at trying to do my best to single task so like you said when I was writing my book I stopped writing my newsletter for a few months but then hey I wrote a book that's like like 290 pages in in two and a half months which feels like it's pretty fast. I'm sure other people can write faster, but that feels pretty fast. (laughs) Yeah. And especially since I I also have a business, I don't just live off of (laughs) being an author. I think there's many people who do that unless your name's Stephen King, but, or JK Rawlings. Um, But I think that it, we, I think we more need to become okay with the fact that we don't have, like I said, we don't have to be 
on and available to everybody all the time. Like I haven't had notifications on any of my devices outside of phone calls and text messages probably six years. Like I don't know if somebody tweeted me. I don't know if somebody emailed me. I don't know if, so, if like most things happen unless I'm, I'm doing the thing. Mm-hmm. So if I'm writing, the only thing open on my computer is my writing program. If I'm in email, the only thing open on my computer is a Safari tab with Gmail. If I'm on Twitter, the only thing open is Twitter. And I feel like by doing that, I just like people are always like, I can't believe you got that done so fast. I'm like, it, it doesn't seem fast to me because it was the only thing that I was working on. And I feel like the more that I have, um, the more that I kind of figure out what works for me and what doesn't, because I think it's different for everyone, the more I can get more productive with my work. And I think productivity really relates to efficiency. So if I'm more productive, I'm getting my work done faster and then I don't have to do uh, a more work, then I don't have to do more work, which is always nice, even though I really like my work, but I still don't want to do that like eight hours a day or 10 hours a day or more. We're going to take a quick break. Listening is a great skill to cultivate. I know I've gotten better at listening by hosting this show. I listen closely to my guests. I listen closely to other podcasts when I do my research. And that has spread into other aspects of my life and work. Just imagine what you could do if you cultivated better listening. And one great way to work on listening is with Audible. With Audible, you get access to an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, including bestsellers, motivation, mysteries, thrillers, memoirs, and more. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. And now with Audible Originals, the selection has gotten even more custom with content made for members. I really love listening to biographies. Check out Snowball, which is the extensive biography of Warren Buffett, my former neighbor. Right now you can get started listening to Audible with a free 30-day trial. Go to audible.com slash loveyourwork or text loveyourwork to 500-500 to get started. That's audible, A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash love your work or text love your work as all one word to 500-500. Well, and you mentioned multitasking, but multitasking, I think most of us think of multitasking as, you know, you're trying to have this chat conversation while you're trying to write a book. Difficult to do. Mm-hmm, but, there's yeah. also, but there's also multitasking on more of a meta level where you're trying to write this book, but then you're also trying to do uh, other things that you regularly do in your business, like on a, on a meta level, whether that's like, you know, during a, the same day, during the same week, during the same month, you're working on these two different projects. So it sounds like that's something that you're trying to reduce as well. Yeah. And I, so I, so one, I really like doing different things at different, different times because I like that. I'm really not bored in my business because even though I try to run a very boring business and a, a calm business, I guess to use the words of uh, Freed and DHH, but I also like the like I like the idea that my business isn't just one thing. I like that one month I can be working on a book, another month I can be doing software, another month I can be making a course. Like that to me is fun, but I don't know how to do those things well or quickly if I'm trying to do all of them at once. So if I'm writing a book, I'm not like my courses aren't opening during those months. Or if I'm like releasing a major software version, I don't have a book or something else on the go. So I try to, I, I guess it's, kind, it's, it's a little bit on a weekly level and, but it's a, a lot on a monthly level. Like there's sort of themes like this month right now is promotion for the book. Mm-hmm. And I don't have any, there's no courses opening. There's no, I'm not sending any newsletters because the, holidays when we're recording as well. Um, I'm not working on anything else. And so I try to make my business so there's sort of like themes every month where it's like this is the this is the project that I'm working on. And then weekly, I, I kind of set it up where Monday and Friday I never do calls unless I absolutely have to. And even then it's very begrudgingly. <laughs> like if somebody can only talk on a Monday or a Friday, then I might, but almost never do I, I book calls on Mondays and I'm Fridays. Same, I'm the same with Mondays and Tuesdays. <laughs> yeah. As well. And I feel like I, I think that that's smart because I know that those are days where if I need to really dig into something in my business, I can. And I'm so introverted that if I spent time on the phone every day, I would be pretty drained. And days when I do have calls all day, I am pretty drained. And so I don't beat myself up if, if, if it's a day when I have calls. If I get no other work done, I, I, it's fine because that's been, that's been my goal for the day. 
is to be uh, as on and as um, able to talk as possible. Which is like the worst way to say that, even though that's the point I'm trying to make. But like that's what I, like that's my like today. This is this is a call day for me, so I have a, a few calls, not very many. Otherwise, it would be too difficult. And that to me, like I know how my energy works and how my attention and my focus works. So I just try to play into those things as much as possible. Because if I'm doing something, I want to do it well. <laughs> so it would this interview would suck if it was like the eighth interview of the day and I also had to answer a hundred emails and write um like a new software feature. Like it would be a very awful interview. Yeah, so it sounds like you're you're really managing your mental state in a way. Yeah. For sure. Is that, I even know like yeah. the time of day. Like I'm I'm better at creative work in the morning. So that's when I always try to plan to do um like my most creative work or my most mentally challenging work. Yeah, um, yeah, this is exactly the way I do it. I mean, I don't know when we scheduled this, I might have told you, oh, we can do Thursday of this week or Thursday of that week, you know, because like Thursday afternoon, that's prime podcast uh, interview time. And sometimes I I don't, I don't get to do it on that time, but I'm surprised that uh, I don't meet more people who have more like uh, more of a like, oh, you know, that bucket of time is just, I don't do that during that time. (laughs) Yeah, it's, it's fine. like if we don't set boundaries for ourselves, like other people are going to set them for us. And then we just have to hope that the line in the sand that they've drawn works for us. And I also find that the more that I have like just general rules about that, the more people are like, okay. Like if you say, hey, Paul, let's talk on Friday. And I'm like, I, I can't do a call on Friday with you. That feels kind of personal. But if I say I don't do any calls with anybody on Friday, then you're like, that's a rule that Paul has. That's, that, sounds, that sounds legit. Like I, I'm, I'm more inclined to to honor that and understand and empathize with that than just like oh, he doesn't want to talk to me. Like who does that guy think he well, is? Well, and it usually doesn't even it doesn't even get to that. I, I usually no. find that if I if I just kind of give some options that fit within my time frames, it seems to work almost all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, we get scared that when we start when we when we try to establish boundaries with other people, we there is a lot of fear involved in that. But most of the time, the other person is like, okay, cool. Right. Like and, it's the, the smallest deal ever. And then they can't see your calendar, you know. Yeah. I, I think that's what happens or what I, the way I used to do things was, uh, you know, somebody wants to have coffee or something. Oh, well, I'll just look at my calendar. If there's not something on my calendar, uh, then I'm just going to go ahead and do that thing. But now that I have these rules, it's a lot more focused. It makes it easier to find a time to do things. It makes it easier to decide what's not a priority and then I'm going to say no to. Um, yeah. And even though I don't have something blocked off on my <clears throat> calendar, I certainly at, at least know that I'm going to be doing um, something in, in particular during that time. So I, I think this idea of, and I, I apologize if it sounds too formal, but resource allocation, like that's, that's at the basis of uh, uh, abstractly, that's like really what, what this, what this is. And, For sure. um, you know, it's something that I've discovered myself over the years and one of the greatest ways I've discovered it is through this podcast, through doing this podcast, which, by the way, um, you're responsible for. Um, oh. I, I don't know if you know this story. Uh, hopefully I'll get I, to this. I totally don't. I'll I get to this hear resource it, allocation thing. But, but I was in New York. I was in a, a room that I had rented. I was going to spend a month there. And I had been thinking about starting a podcast for, uh, I don't know, 10 years something like that. And, you know, bit by bit, I had maybe, you know, thought through some elements of it. But then I got this email um, from your Sunday dispatches. And uh, it was talking about how fun it was and how easy it was to have a podcast. And I immediately booked my first podcast interview (laughs) upon getting that email. Now, but here's the beef that I have was that you were totally lying (laughs) (laughs) about how easy it was. Yeah, it's definitely. Well, I, I think guess it depends a, upon your your standards or you know how obsessive you are. Yeah, and I mean, I think there's a there's a difference between like easy and fun. Like, there's a lot of things that I really really enjoy that are really not that easy. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah, no, I, I I totally get that, and yeah, I I, I I'm both flattered and I apologetic, <laughs> but at the same time, and now this is where the resource allocation comes in because that was. You know, the first year or so, I was trying to kind of find my voice and, you know, spending a ton of time on every single episode. But now that I'm three years in, now I've got a system. I mean, I've got, mm-hmm. uh, 
I, I've got uh, to-doist templates for with all the tasks and what date do I need to do this task to get everything done in time. Uh, I've got interview seasons that help me manage my resources that way. I've got all these systems in place. And it's just amazing to me that I can still do the same work, the same quality of work, perhaps higher. Um, and and the thing I have to thank for it is the fact that it's a repeatable thing, that every Thursday mm-hmm. it comes out, uh, I don't miss a week, and here's the system that I've devised that allows me to make that happen. So that's something that I've learned from doing this podcast, and it's something I'm starting to try to apply to other parts of, of my business, because something about my personality is such that if I just do it whenever I feel like it, it's going to be very sporadic. If I make a rule that I'm going to do something uh, on a certain schedule, I'm a type of person, I'm going to do it. Uh, do you have any things like that that you've done where you force yourself to do something repeatable uh, or have a system in place that helps you uh, focus and manage your energy? Yeah, I mean, why do you think I called my newsletter the Sunday Dispatches? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it forced me to to send out um, a, a, an email with weekly cadence. And I definitely, and this actually comes back to um, me being very, trying to avoid stress. So if I know that I have to write uh, an email every single week and I haven't missed a week other than times when I've like scheduled breaks uh, and I started my newsletter in November uh, 2012 and I've never missed a Sunday. Mm. And so it would be very stressful for me to write that email Saturday night. And it would also be very hard for me to convince Matt to copy edit it like in the middle of the night. <laughs> so <laughs> if I work... <laughs> yeah. So if I work ahead of my schedule... I'm less stressed out. And if I work ahead of my schedule, then I have the space to be creative. And I have the space to write things that I think are going to be worth writing. And even like yesterday, Matt and I were working on an article and it wasn't good enough. So I scrapped it. But because I'm, uh, I think, four or five weeks... Actually, I'm a bit more than that because I'm not sending emails right now. So I'm five weeks ahead of start when the newsletter starts again when it when it comes back to life. And so I don't feel stressed that one of the articles wasn't good enough because I don't want to share an article that's not good enough with my audience. And so by working ahead of my schedule, I'm never stressed out because I just have the space to create. And I think that it's funny. I think that a lot of creatives kind of shy away from from systems and processes because they feel like, oh, it's gonna hamper my creative style, man. Like it's just gonna like it's gonna get in the way and like I'm a creative and so I just need things to flow. And I think the opposite of tr- is true. I think that when we do put um, like systems and processes and, and, and boundaries in place, then we're doing so to take the the menial task, the administrative task, the 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 decision making that isn't that doesn't require any creative energy off of our plate. So by doing these things, by by making these things into systems or, or processes or, or boundaries or general rules, then the only thing left for us to do, the only the thing that we've made the most space for in that is to be creative. And I feel like that's a, that's just something that a lot of creative people, I don't know if they disagree with me or that maybe they maybe they just not tried it or maybe they just work completely different, but I feel like if I take all of the things off of my plate um, through systems or through working ahead of my schedule, then all that's left is is the creative work. And I love the creative work. And I mean that's why I don't want to be a manager. That's why I don't want to manage people. I don't want to promote myself out of the job I love because I love doing the work that I do. And I want to keep doing it. So if I create these things and put them in place, then they make the decisions for me. They make it so I don't have like decision fatigue in my life or in my business. I can just do the things in a way that I know works. I can adjust as necessary, of course, but it just it just works so much better. It's, it's, there's just so much ease in in doing things like that for me. Yeah, I th- agree so much with this. I, I mean. It, it really does free up a lot of creative energy. And I think it's a thing that uh, I just had never tried it before. Um, and so I didn't, or I was skeptical of it. And I re- came to realize that a lot of that skepticism was resistance in a way, um, mm-hmm. in, in that, you know, for example, doing this podcast, I, I finish up things and have it ready for my editors on a monthly basis. So, you know, there's, there's, certain quality things that get affected like by that. So for example, I can't give everybody an update about what's going on in my life this particular week necessarily. 
But that's not the end of the world. I still get the podcast out. It's still good. I can still drop in a note here and there if there's something going on with my visa or, or something yeah. like that. And it still works out. But before, I would, I would just say, well, I can't, you know, I wouldn't be able to really have real-time updates about certain things. So, you know, I'm just going to not do it. And that would be the reason why I wouldn't do it. Were, did you ever resist uh, creating systems like this? Um, yeah, I probably did. Like even with some of my earlier podcasts where there, it felt, it's fun. Like my newsletter never feels like a chore because it, it, there's such a system and process in place that the only thing left is the joy of creating. Mm -hmm. Whereas other things that I've tried to, Whoa, to wait, establish. Wait, wait, wait. Let's say that again. <laughs> Uh, by taking, by by using the 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 systems and processes that I have, the only thing left for me to do is to in, enjoy the joy of creating. The joy that is so good. <laughs> okay, I just had you had I had to have you repeat that anyway. Sorry, there to you go. I'm glad that I remember. I'm glad that I remembered the second time. To be honest, <laughs> um, but when I don't, yeah, when I don't do that, I it feels like things become a chore. Like I had a a weekly podcast that I was just trying to do, like by the seat of my pants. And it became like after a couple of weeks, like it just became, it became a stress and it became like a chore. And I'm like, I don't want this to be a chore. Whereas the shows that I do that are seasonally based that we can record like with time to spare to get to our, our editors and to, to make the show notes and everything else. Like the things that I do that, that just have, that have the decisions made for me based on decisions I've previously made that I can just basically like, to do as template them out. I'm like, this is good. Like, this is mm -hmm. fun. This, and it also makes things like my newsletter has been around for six years. And the only reason it's been around for six years is because I haven't burnt out. I haven't stressed out about it forever because it just works in, in the way that it works. And if it didn't work that way, I, I would, I would change things, but I would still keep a process in place. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think another thing that held me back from it is, is I guess I'll call it like my vision muscle. And this is a, a valid thing. And this is a valid reason to not have a system in place is that say the first podcast episode <clears throat> I ever did, if I had decided, you know, ahead of time that, uh, you know, it's going to follow this format and this is going to be the process, yeah. etc. I had no way of knowing that. So is that something that you've experienced? But now that I now that I do, I could I could create another podcast and I could imagine the entire thing in my head and have certain things in place ahead of time and be able to follow that plan. Um, so is that something that you experienced yourself? For sure. Like in the beginning of anything, I don't care about what the process is. Yeah. I want to, what the process is. I want to figure it out and do it and then let the process happen based on the experience that I have doing it. Like even my newsletter, um, in the beginning, it was like updates for websites that I was doing. I don't even do that anymore. <laughs> I don't do client work anymore. So that's kind of that would be kind of weird. And so I think that we need to be we need to be open in the beginning to figure out what the process is because it's going to be different for everybody, and it's going to be based a lot on like how you like to work. And a lot of times, like I'm not smart enough to know how I like to work without experiencing that work first. And so I do need to have a little bit in the beginning where I'm just like, how does this work? Let's, let's try it out. Let's see what works, what doesn't work. And then just slowly over time, like cut out, okay, this isn't working. I'm going to cut it out. Or I'm going to make a decision now, now that I have experience. And this is a decision that I'm going to stick with until it no longer fits what I need. And I think that that, like, it would be very difficult, I, I believe, to, to start something with a, with a set of rigid process and hope that it just, <laughs> hope that it just works out. Mm -hmm. But it's also interesting to me that you send the Sunday dispatches on Sunday. Cause one, it seems like, well, then you've got to work on the weekends, um, which might not be true. We can get into that. And then two, that's yeah. like the dark side of the moon on the internet. It's like yeah. nobody's, nobody's looking at their email on Sunday. Yeah, I schedule them in advance. I use Mailchimp, so I just schedule. I just use the scheduler thingamajig, and it's it's done. And I don't, I don't know. I feel like my emails are like they definitely relate to business, but they relate to business in such a personal way that I'm like, I don't know, Sunday seems nice. Like there was no scientific method that went into sending an email on Sunday, other than I think at the time when I started it, Chris Brogan was sending emails on Sunday, and his were super personal. I was like. I really like waking up to to, to Chris Brogan. Oh, cool! <laughs> and I was like, I this this seems like something that 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 I should try as well. 
And so like I didn't test different days to see like, oh, is my open rates or my engagement rates different? I'm just like, no, I like this. And people email me and they're like, I really like getting this email on Sunday. So my inbox is less full. Now we're just going to send their emails on Sunday, but it actually doesn't <laughs> matter. <laughs> but they're like, I like getting this and, and being able to like read this first thing. And it kind of helps me think about my week. And I'm like, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> that's also a lot of pressure, but that's pretty awesome as well. Well, this is something so, I've been learning as, as, as a company of one is... Is that there? You hear these things about how you, what's the optimal way to do something, and so for example, with a podcast, what's the optimal day to release a podcast? I would say Tuesday. Tuesday morning would be the perfect time to release a podcast. I release it on Thursdays. Um, I do that because that gives me in the beginning it gave me a little bit of lead time because I was doing it on a weekly basis, mm-hmm. uh, and that way I could concentrate on Monday and Tuesday on my my other big creative projects. But while Tuesday is not as optimal, well, Thursday is not as optimal as Tuesday, how much difference does it really make? It might not make any at all. And the cost of doing it on Tuesday would mean that the beginning of my week was was focused on the podcast, instead of being focused on the work that makes people even want to listen to the podcast. And that that the cost of that is everything. You know, mm-hmm. the cost of this tiny idea of optimization can be huge when you're working with limited resources. For sure. And a lot of like people ask me all the time, well, like, how should I do this? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Like, also, I, I feel the weight of advice giving that I wish more people would feel, <laughs> to be honest, where I don't really want to influence, like, I always want to find the, the like, fine line. And I, I I doubt I do it very well all the time, but I want to find the fine line of like being able to share the the nuance of experience while not wanting to guide people explicitly into like like what you were saying, like this is the optimal time to send this email or to release this podcast. It's like you're not going to know until you try it because what's right for me or what's right for the industry is not right for for everybody. So it's, it's definitely it's definitely difficult, but ultimately, like, and it comes back to the first thing that we're talking about. Like, if it's my business, I kind of want to call the shots, mm-hmm. and so I don't want some. I also have a problem with authority, which is a bit of an issue. But like, I don't want somebody telling me like this is the way it's supposed to be done. I want to be like, I don't care how it's done. I want to see what works for me, and if it's not working, obviously I can change it, but. I'd rather just try it first and and see what I like, see what my audience likes, see where that like juicy center is between what they want and what I want. I think what held me back from making decisions like that, or you know, deciding to just do it at a non optimal time for a long time, um, I think was just loss aversion. This this yeah. bias that like, oh, I'm gonna lose this little tiny bit and not really seeing what I can and, and there therefore just not do it at all often. And not see what I can what I can gain from the the process. Um, what one other thing I, I wonder if if you do that I do now that it took me a long time to decide to, to to learn and that I'm learning now is that when I come across anything that I do in my business, uh, I'll just make a list of oh I do this and then I do that just a process list and maybe it's not perfect the first time but then the next time I do it. I take out my process list. I make it a little bit better, and then eventually I'm able to, like I, before this podcast, I had a process list of you know tech check things. I don't have to think about doing that thing. I just have to follow the list, and and my mind can be on the conversation. Uh, I can't believe how long it took for me to discover this. I wish somebody would have <laughs> told me. Is that something that you do? Yeah, I make a list for everything. I have notes for everything, like because I don't want to like like you, like I don't want to have to make every decision every single time like i want to see what decision works and stick to that un- unless there's unless there's something that isn't working anymore so yeah i do the same thing i make so many notes and if i don't ever look at them that's totally fine if i'm doing the same thing again i know how to find that note and i look to see okay this is what i did if this takes 50% of my decision making capacity off my plate then i'm super happy well, and I've been surprised that it actually makes um, tasks that I see as drudgery seem less drudgerous 
yeah. <laughs> in that, uh, oh, well, I can take out my list. I can make my list better. And suddenly like, oui. that makes me happy. Uh, yeah, you're not starting with a blank slate. You're only starting with a blank slate one time. And I think blank slates are scary. So if we can avoid those at all costs, it's, it's always a good thing. In, in building a company of one, what would you say is the biggest personal challenge or change or way that you... I mean, I know you build it around the way that that, that you think and the way that you do things, but what are the ways that you've had to grow um, that have been the the biggest changes for you or the most challenging? Yeah, I mean, it, it was very challenging to go from from client to product, and I mean, it took two and a half years, but it was definitely a, a good move. It's been challenging to to run up against um, things like because I build a lot of um, products with other people, and I think I, I've learned the hard way a few times that. I think it's good to find somebody when you're partnering um, that that has a that has a beneficial skill set where you kind of pull your both your resources together. But it's important to have the conversation of I think a lot of times we we talk uh, about like well it, like what's going to happen if this fails and and that. But I think a, a more important conversation is what happens if this succeeds. Because say I had a say I took on a partner um, with a software product, and they would only consider the software product a success if we had like a hundred thousand uh, dollars a month, and we had thousands of customers, and we had like a big company. And I'm over here being like, "What? Well, I don't want that." Like, a success to me is like if if we can both make a couple grand a month and cover most of our stuff and work on other things. Mm-hmm. And so I think having the conversation of like. Well, what does this look like if we succeed, and how do we define what a success is and what a success isn't? I think is really important. And I mean, I have had growing pains with that. I mean, it's really hard to run a literal company of one. Like, I think we all need, like, just because we work by ourselves doesn't, or just because we work for ourselves doesn't mean we have to work by ourselves. And so I think even if we're working with like freelancers or like editors or, or just like partners on specific things, there's it. There's always some interaction that's required, and like navigating those those human <laughs> relationships is is typically where I come, where I where I run into to issues. Um, but I'm always working towards like making sure that 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 those are dealt with and not happen again. So now, like even with you know, if we're talking about checklists, like I I, I have a checklist for partnerships hmm. now. That basically goes over like if you want to partner with this person, make sure you have conversation. It's just like before you get married to somebody, like it's a good idea to have a conversation about like kids and and religion and probably a couple other things. So I just have a like I have a list of of things that I that I need to talk about first with a potential partner before we get super excited. Because in the beginning, it's like it's super exciting to build something new with somebody, but we shouldn't forget that there's also like some pragmatic things that need to be discussed mm-hmm. <laughs> like like kid, like kids and religion <laughs> yeah and, and you can you can make checklists for these things that yeah. aren't necessarily procedural that are more abstract and you know just after you have a, a partnership sit, look back and think of what what are the questions that you wish you would have asked and then the next time yeah. um, you're able to ask them so I mean I could dig into this so much more we could we could talk for hours about this stuff uh, so Paul Jarvis, it's been so such a pleasure to to finally chat with you. Um, what would you say would be your final message to people out there who are uh, fantasizing about building a company of one or integrating the, the, these ideas into their company of not one? Yeah, I think that the first thing to to think about, and there's not like 50 things, <laughs> the first thing to think about is that growth is like, we all need growth in the beginning. Like we all need to grow from zero to something with our business. So we all adopt this growth mindset and assume that it is, and at the time, it's exactly what serves us because we need to grow in the beginning. But at some point, maybe that growth doesn't make sense. And the point of the book is not, to, is, isn't, say no to all growth all the time. I would never advocate for that. It's just that we have to question growth. And I think the best way to question growth is to start to think about like what do we like what do we need? Like what do we want? Like what is success for us? And I think the best way that I've that I've found to to do that and the best counterbalance to this growth mindset is is this idea of enough. So I like to ask three things. So I like to ask how much is enough? How will I know when I've reached it? And then what will change when I do? Because I think that's going to lead to better business because it has for myself at least. It's led to making better decisions and made 
and led to being okay with saying no to things that I know are not going to serve me. If I know what enough is, I know that I can work towards that and then optimize instead of work towards growth and then never stop and never question growth ever, forever and ever. So I think that the idea of, of enough and, and contemplating that is is probably the most important thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, define enough, how figure out how you're going to get there. Go ahead and write these things down. I think that, that would, that's yeah. a useful exercise. So Company of One, Why Staying Small is the Next Big Thing for Business. Everybody should go out and get that. It's a great book. Uh, where else can they get more of you, Paul Jarvis? Yeah, so um, the, the thing that we've been talking about a lot is my, my mailing list, the Sunday Dispatches. If you Google Paul Jarvis on the first couple pages, it's PJRBS, but nobody ever remembers that. So that, like, my mailing list is really the, the easy, like, I'm not on LinkedIn, I'm not on Facebook, I'm not on most places. The easy, I don't think even think, I don't even have an email address uh, for contacting on my website, but my, because my mailing list is, is the chosen method that I both communicate to and communicate with my audience. And I feel like, one, I love doing that. And two, the, the, the quality of conversations I have from people who are on my list and who are agreeing or even disagreeing with me ha- has been some of the most interesting things um, that I've found in, in terms of running my own business. So my mailing list, other than buying the book, which I, I think that you should, uh, my mailing list is probably the best way to, to hear more of what we were talking about today. All right. Thank you so much for being on the show, Paul. Yeah, thank you very much. It was was my pleasure and I'm glad that we got to talk today. Is Love Your Work helping you find your unique creative voice? Does it bring you the inspiration and motivation you need to become the creator and human you want to be? If so, please be a part of making this a special and nourishing and thoughtful show. Support the show on Patreon. You'll be an even bigger part of this show than you already are. If you contribute just a coffee a month, you'll be helping support the hosting and production of Love Your Work. Everyone has some unique creative gift to offer the world. Together, we can give people the tools they need to bring that work into the world. The world will be better off for it. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash This is a different kind of model for supporting the work you love. The choice is yours. Vote with your dollars, put your money where your mind is, and keep Love Your Work going. Visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash As a thank you, you'll get early access, bonus content, and a discount on Love Your Work merchandise. Learn more at patreon.com slash That's patreon.com slash K-A, D as in David, A, B as in Victor, Y. Love Your Work is brought to you in part by our Patreon supporters, such as mini sponsor Roxana Maynard of Agility Alchemist at agilityalchemist.com and top supporters such as Jeffrey Mason and Vitas Pankovicius. This has been Love Your Work, and I'm David Cadavy. The theme music for this show is At Sea by Dorena from the album About Everything and More by arrangement with Deep Elm Records at deepelm.com. Love Your Work is a production of Cadavy, Inc. <laughs>